The image of Iwate as that, as a survival of, for example, Meiji Japan of 100 years ago, or even before that, certainly is pervasive in Japanese culture. And that's the reason I went there, because I wanted to look at the real Japan, thinking that all of these developments that are occurring in the, in the urban centers are something new and Western and that kind of thing. I was totally wrong. Dr. L. Keith Brown is professor of anthropology at the University of Pittsburgh and has been studying modern Japanese society for more than 30 years. He has written many articles on the Japanese family and on local social organization with a focus upon the area around Mizusawa, a city in Iwate Prefecture 300 miles north of Tokyo. Historian Jackson H. Bailey also has done research on life in Iwate and today, the two of them talk about the changes they have witnessed in regional Japan over a quarter of a century. In what sense were you wrong? Uh, there's, there's two ways it's wrong. One is assuming that the cities are new. Well, Kyoto and Nara are, are some of the oldest cities in the world. Uh, and Edo, now Tokyo, for how many years? 900 years? And several hundred years ago had population over a million. So cities are not new in Japan. The town of Mizusawa, has, at least since 1629, been a fairly large town. And the, the castle lord came to Mizusawa because there was already a town there. The other side of that is that the hamlet of 31 households, where I've been working for 31 years, continues to get together as a hamlet and have parties, and there's a freedom within those hamlets that they don't have as soon as they're joined by outsiders. The idea that that is traditional Japan and no longer exists, or that if we see that in Iwate that has this image of being traditional ancient Japan, I think is not true. You will find that in uh, corporations in Tokyo, that you will mm -hmm. find a group of colleagues of a section who when they have a party, they get together with people that they know and will work with for 38 years. Uh, there's a freedom there that uh, is very similar to what you see in the Hamlet. So I don't think it is an archaic Japan. Mm -hmm. I think it is modern contemporary Japan. It has a different expression. Sure. Keith, when we think about Iwate, uh, let's sort of put it in the national context. Now, where does it fit physically, historically? It's in the north. Uh, when I first went there 30-some years ago, it took 13 hours by train to get up to the southern part of the prefecture. So I think its location within Japan is significant, but that shouldn't be taken to mean that it is isolated because in the 12th century there was Hiraizumi, a major development of the aristocracy, and it had maybe as many as 100,000 people, but nevertheless the distance from Tokyo, the distance from the core of Japan so-called, uh, is significant. So psychologically people when you say Iwate, they think, oh my, long way away. They do in... Uh, Even now. They do in Tokyo. Yes. And they think of these tremendous, gorgeous mountains, and so they think of mountain people. Sure. When in fact there is also this very impressive plain that runs up almost the center of the prefecture from south to much of the north that is lowland, flatland, produces great rice, and has for a number of years, and that's where most of the developments have been and continue to be. What's life like in the various parts of the prefecture? Now, down where you have spent a lot of your time in the last 30 years, uh, that's largely rice-growing area, or has been traditionally, hasn't it? Has been traditionally. But also because for more than a thousand years, there has been this communication system up this valley that continues today. Uh, in the old days, there were post towns along this route. Uh, then there was the main Tohoku railroad line put in 100 years ago. Uh, and now there is what you call what? The, to the Tohoku Expressway, right. uh, the super highway that comes up here. Uh, this area then has experienced considerable economic development of the high tech type. So this little village that I've been in now has Hitachi Color Television Factory. Uh, there mm. is a Fujitsu uh, computer facility a few miles away. 
there is uh, NEC, uh, Nippon Denki facility, a few miles to the south, making various kinds of high-tech appliances and other sorts of things. And Toyota is now considering making a large assembly plant in this area because of the, the infrastructure that has been there on a base that was established some thousands of years ago. This area is, is into high economic development. So in that sense, it really shares with the rest of Japan a process that's been going on now a thousand years, a hundred years, and now 30 years. That is the, uh, the development of infrastructure, yes. particularly transportation. Uh, but that has enabled the southern part to share more fully in the development than the northern part, because the northern and the eastern part out here on the coast uh, are still scrambling to catch up. They still have a sense that they are way behind, and the, the problem really comes down to transportation for them. You need to build that infrastructure. So I was interested to hear that there is a plan to build an expressway cutting across the prefecture. That's right. The, the, the expressway has had a tremendous impact because all of these multinational electronics firms in this Silicon Valley of Iwate uh, can be making parts, and at 5 o'clock in the evening they can put the parts on a truck, and at 8 o'clock in the morning when the factory opens in Tokyo, those parts are there at the dock. Mm -hmm. And I've ridden the bus several times with my farmer friends. At 9 o'clock in the evening they will get on a bus their cattle have already been shipped off, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, they'll be at the stockyards in Tokyo, and they will be ready then to see their steer auctioned off at something like eight or $10,000 mm -hmm. a head. Uh, this expressway now makes Japan more unified. It certainly so does. These people don't talk about the isolation. Now, it also exacerbates the north-south split it in does. Iwate. Because, the people, for instance, up in, in a place called Iwaizumi, uh, east of, of Morioka in the mountains, uh, they are raising uh, local beef. There's no way that that farmer can do what you were just saying. Now, they, uh, he can do it in Morioka, and that's beginning to happen. I'm expecting a megalopolis up this valley mm -hmm. as the economic development of the whole country continues mm -hmm. to, to proceed then these provincial areas where land is cheap, relatively, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. compared to... Compared to anywhere else. In, uh, in anywhere the, else. Uh, yeah. It has uh, a quality labor force, and it has this infrastructure, will, will continue to increase. I see good things mm -hmm. for the next half century, anyway, for this part of Japan. I frequently hear, especially in the core areas of Japan, uh, the concern about this development is going to destroy uh, the cultural roots of Japan because these people are going to become high-tech. But I th think there's some, some good effects of that. Uh, people in the village where I have been working uh, can stay in farming because they have outside employment. Mm -hmm. So they do the farming early morning, uh, then they go to right. work on the outside. They can do that because they have other jobs. Right. I wonder if the mountain areas, for example, the people aren't going to have to just give up in the, terms of farming. Uh, they're not competitive mm -hmm. on an international right. scale. Uh, whereas these people are producing a rice that is, in fact, very tasty, uh, they may be able to, to hang in there a bit, even if the rice market opens up. Mm -hmm. but these people now are clearly very much involved in the international sure. economic political scene. And, and that, that phenomenon that the Japanese call kengyo, Mm -hmm. of uh, farming and as a side occupation, really. Mm -hmm. But I think nationally, something like 80% of the uh, More. agricultural production, 85, 90, yeah. it's approaching that, is done by part-time farmers. Sure. And, cer and certainly in southern Iwate, that's the case. If you want to make a comparison with the United States, where the land area is, is larger and the population is more dispersed in the rural areas, you don't have this op the same opportunity that you do for part-time farming or free-time farming uh, that these people have. Mm -hmm. This is almost an ideal situation. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, up here, they're experimenting with sort of alternative agricultural things, trying to find niche markets with beef, with fruit. Uh, there's a lot of experimentation, uh, but no, uh, no sense yet 
that they are tapping into something that will that they can sustain. That's hard. It it really is. The, it's a it's a tough. With the United States pushing to have a liberalization of mm -hmm. the rice market in Japan, the the government and the local areas and the individual farmers are looking for ways to diversify their operations. But what they do best and what they do with the least amount of labor is rice. Mm -hmm because of the transplanters mm -hmm. and the combines and all the other equipment, for them to get into something else, I don't know about orchards because we don't have so many down here mm -hmm. in, in the lowlands, but uh, beans and vegetables, onions mm -hmm. and carrots and all of these kinds of things take a lot more labor, mm -hmm. take a lot more time. And labor costs are going up because of the high-tech development in the area. So the diversification mm -hmm. of agriculture is going to be hard. It's hard. Uh, how much is Iwate dependent on who the decisions of Tokyo, and how much does its own initiative make, make a difference in what's going on? What, what do you think from your experience there in Mizusawa and elsewhere? Uh, they're very much party to national events, and in fact, international events. So what happens in Washington, D.C. in terms of policy towards liberalization of beef and rice and other kinds of things affects these people immediately. Uh, therefore, they're part of the national and international scene. To what extent are they victims of those kinds of things? Uh, they are, but also they're the beneficiaries. A uh, hundred years ago, when the National Railway went in, replicating this old road that's been there for a thousand years, uh, that had tremendous impact on these people, and I think to the good. Uh, for example, the town of Mizusawa is about uh, six kilometers from the town of Iwayado. Iwayado decided a hundred years ago they didn't want the train coming to Iwayado, even though one plan had been to put the station in Iwayado because they were afraid that the vibrations of the railroad would damage the roots of the rice crop and they had a realistic, I think, a realistic fear that the smoke coming out of the, the smokestack could in fact incite fires. Well, it has. Mm -hmm. uh, their decision, though, to block it from coming into Iwayado pushed it over to Mizusawa. Mizusawa was not successful in blocking the railroad. Mizusawa has boomed because the railroad, of course, has turned out to be an essential source of communications for the whole area. Uh, Iwayado, on the other hand, has gone stagnant, in fact, has lost population. These kinds of developments are national effort. A prefecture cannot build its own expressway, it cannot build its own train uh, route, and therefore it takes a national policy. But the policy to go up this old route rather than, say, up the coastline, economic factors dictate that, as well as political factors, sure. uh, are going to have a very serious human consequences. I'll say a little bit more about Mizusawa, uh, because you've, you've tracked that now for 30 years. It's a great place to live. And they say that. This isn't just the foreign anthropologist who happens to like it. Uh, they say that. Uh, that's why the best job is to come back and be one of the two successful applicants every year out of more than 200 who apply for a job in the city office. Uh-huh. Yes. They'd rather do that than live in Tokyo because this is more spacious. Uh, the environment is mm -hmm. clean. Uh, a 10-minute commute to work. Right. And they're in their local community where they know people. They like the people. Mm -hmm. It is a comfortable life. If I were them, that's what I would want to do. Sure. And, and there are surveys which indicate that that is the aspiration of young people from Iwate these days. Yeah. Those who have already gone to Tokyo and are there would say, oh, yes, I'll go back if I possibly can. But is there a job? Show is me there a job. A job? Okay. And interestingly, in the 70s and 80s, uh, the first jobs came in the, in the city and town offices, in building the, the infrastructure whether it was in education or in economic development or in town planning or whatever. And the struggle then is how do you get beyond that mm -hmm. into, a self, into an economically sustainable mm -hmm. kind of job situation because if the only jobs are, are in government, it then won't it, it won't work. The town has had uh, a history of being part of the northern region brain drain in the sense of very prominent Japanese have come from Mizusawa, but they have had their fame going to Tokyo, becoming prime minister, becoming the mayor of Tokyo, or those kinds of things. They've had a number of those people. Uh, 
I guess it's harder to have your fame made in Mizusawa per se. Uh, the farmers 30 years ago were essentially full-time farmers. And out of 72 families now, I know only one full-time farmer. Mm. All the others have outside jobs. Mm -hmm. And some of them are living very well, whereas an annual income 30 years ago might have been maybe 3000 for a family. Uh, I know a number of farm families now who have annual incomes well over 100000 because they have other kinds of jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, one family, for example, there's a grandmother in her 70s who takes care of the agricultural operations. Uh, there is her son in his early 50s who works in the Hitachi color television factory. His wife works as a checkout clerk in a supermarket. Their son is a computer specialist for the telephone company. They work hard, especially the women work hard. Mm -hmm. So the, the mother in her 50s who works as a checkout clerk at a supermarket, she says that uh, on Sunday, if it's a nice day, she has to go out and work on the farm with her husband. Uh, if it rains, she goes to the supermarket and works as a checkout clerk, and he sits there listening to his hi-fi watching sumo on the television set or something. He has a day off. She never has a day off. Mm -hmm. Not a good life for the women. So this great-grandson that is now getting close to middle school, in 10 more years, he's going to want to get married. His chances, even though the, the family has an income of over $100,000, wow, that's great. For him to find a wife who wants to marry into that kind of situation is going to be hard. Uh -huh. And I have to agree with the Japanese young women. I wouldn't want to marry into that. Yeah. And I used to think the Japanese women were the happiest people in the world. And there are many that are very happy. But there's this now undercurrent in farm families, rural families. I think the difference between farm families and urban families in this area is not huge in terms of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. They all have their three and four cars in the family. One or two of those will be a truck. Uh, they all take Sunday drives. And within 10 minutes, 15 minutes at most, they're in town. So they all have all the accoutrements of the modern lifestyle, mm -hmm. except they work very hard early morning, late in the evening, and on Sundays, doing that farm. But uh, interesting that they don't want to leave that. Right, right. Now, let's, let's put that in the context of the dozoku and how that, again, gets transformed in the contemporary scene in company relationships and so forth. The dozoku system starts because you have uh, a concept of the family that is lineal, going on from generation to generation to generation. Uh, more often than not through an eldest son, but it may be through a daughter. Uh, if you have this continuation of a family line, uh, then what do you do with the excess children? Some of them may then make branch families who will then go on from generation to generation to generation, which means then these people are your closest kin, and they may be closest kin for 10, 15 generations. Uh, that gives you great opportunity to do a whole variety of things. If you're a farm family, then you can cooperate in farm activities. If you are a very wealthy businessman, then you can call on your branch families uh, to come to your aid if they are also wealthy business people. So it is part of Japanese culture. I went to Iwate to do an autopsy of that system, thinking it's going to be the old Japan and it will fade away. Well, it hasn't. I may live so long to see it fade away. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's being transformed, but the pattern is being used and continues to have some vitality, I take it. That's right. Yeah. yeah the, basic, the basic concerns of family are not dictated by economics. The expressions of family are dictated by economics, but the basic values behind a family, the basic perceptions of what is a family, the basic perceptions of my relationship to my parents and my ancestors and my children and my descendants are not dictated by economics. Now, is that stronger up here? Certainly that in That lineal Tokyo. sense is stronger. L the lineal sense. Robert J. Smith. Sure. has some superb data that show that this lineal thing from generation to generation in a family is stronger up here. 
Does this mean that it was characteristic of all of Japan several centuries ago? I don't think so. I think it's always been stronger up here. The, the regional difference in Japanese culture is significant. For me, uh, this may get some Japanese colleagues angry. For me, it is a huge country because the regional differences in culture of these basic values are significant. Yes, and I think that's very important. That's one of the reasons for looking in some detail at Iwate, not because it's typical of everything else, but in fact because it, it represents regional variation in a very significant way. And has its own. And has its own, sure. Uh, what are some of those uh, things that belong to Iwate that, that you've observed? I haven't done any work in any other part of Japan, so I'm not a good one to, to respond to that. But I think the lineal family thing is one. Uh, the dozoku system may be relatively rare in other parts of Japan, partly because uh, this was a frontier area, and therefore land development three, four, five hundred years ago was more possible than around Kyoto, Nara, and sure. the settled area, therefore people could put their branch families close by. Uh, therefore they had their closest kin close by. Closest kin in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in an emotional sense. And therefore I think you had different kinds of social organization that emerged in this area. Uh, in terms of other cultural things, are these people more conservative politically? No, uh, I don't think so. Uh, they have been LDP supporters as long as the LDP is going to protect their rice market. But uh, a couple of years ago when the LDP was suggesting that they are going to come off of that, these people were quick to start looking for another party. I don't think basically they are any more conservative. Emotionally, I don't think they're any more conservative or any different than other Japanese. But there are some cultural things that are a bit different. Are they any more religious than other Japanese? Oh, I don't think so. No, actually, uh, out on the coast, for instance, there's much less a much less pervasive influence of Buddhism. They haven't mm -hmm. had temples out there. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in one case that I know of, they've only had it for about six, a temple for 60 years. Mm -hmm. Shrines f forever, but, but not temples. So in that sense, they're not, certainly not typical. There's a rather, rather special situation there. Uh, that well, shows the great diversity within, uh, within the prefecture. Within That's why it's always fun to talk with you, because Temples are our central thing with ancestor worship here. And if you have a lineal family, then ancestors are necessary. Right. As David Plath told us in a great article some time ago, uh, the family and the ancestors are tightly woven. Therefore, ancestors and temples, Buddhist temples, are important. I had a young man just last week, now just about 40, young man meaning that he is uh, post-war post-World War II, post-Pacific War generation. Mm -hmm. And he has a job working with Honda. Yeah. A good job, but also he is farming about 10 acres of land, so he has a lot of land to farm. He's the eldest son? He's the eldest son. Mm -hmm. And you would think, well, this guy is going to be modern, liberal, and none of this ancestor stuff. And I said, why don't you sell your land? Get out of this farming. Just do your job, because it's hard work. And he says, I'm protecting this. Protecting it for whom? I'm protecting it for my, for my ancestors, and I'm protecting it for my descendants. Well, that's an interesting idea. Certainly, I don't have that in my own thinking. No, and I, and I think that is quite strong in Iwata. Well, where does this leave us in terms of, uh, as we think about what may happen in Iwata in the next 10 years? Your question then, your comments about the diversity of Iwate then play a role in this. I, I see nothing but good things coming from this high-tech corridor. Um, the infrastructure is there for economic development that will be fantastic. And as the, the economy of Japan continues to boom, this area will participate in that. Uh, there will be some losses. The oldest community hall in Japan started by Goto Shinpei, a Misasawa resident, is now right in the path of a new road that they want to build from the station of the bullet train into the city office of Misasawa. I suspect that that old, historically significant community hall is going to be sacrificed. Mm -hmm. And I, I, 
I get some of that from the people there, that they're, they're sad to see some of these things go. But by and large, not. I had one farmer friend who tell, told me, Brown, even we get to eat sashimi now. And it's been very interesting to see that develop over the last 25 years, mm. where uh, 25 years ago, it was all subsistence fishing. Mm. Almost no fish being sold. In fact, up on the upland, even very close to the coast, mm -hmm. you still couldn't buy fish for your daily food. 30 years ago, they would have mm. sashimi, maybe raw fish, once a year. And they were eating fish maybe once a month. Mm -hmm. And they are enjoying the good life that is coming from this development. It will continue. There will be some losses. Mm -hmm. The community hall is one. Uh, now, to push that one step further, uh, some, one of the things that some of us have heard going around Iwate has been uh, two sorts of tension. One between economic development and environmental protection. That's, that's one tension. The other is between a uh, sort of indigenous culture that belongs to people and is part, infuses their lives on the one hand, and culture that is being made available as a commodity for people, tourists, others to come to Iwate. Those who are concerned about developing, for example, tourist attractions, preserving the tradition of the area, mostly I hear in the city office. Uh, the people out in the streets and the people out in the paddy fields, they want to have a better life. And therefore, I don't see them very often saying, no, we don't want to do that. Uh, environment is another, another matter. So far, I've not seen much environmental degradation because of this high-tech development in this area. This is such a gorgeous area, and the air is so clear that they're not yet sensitive to it. So on the whole, uh, southern Iwate sees the future as pretty bright. I think. Mm -hmm. Realistically so. Mm -hmm. As long as the economy of Japan continues to prosper. Right. But if, if Fujitsu, Hitachi, and these places suffer, Toyota suffer, then these places also will suffer. So they're really fundamentally part of that whole national economy, of course, and international economy. They're part of it. Sure. They're not isolated, and that's not an archaic Japan that we see.